This is episode 18, part 4, The Key of David. First, we need to look briefly at the historical events of a certain time period in history before we can dive into our study. This is a little brief uh, part of the history of the Assyrian Empire first. Tiglath-Pilaser III, 745 to 727 BC, was the king who expanded the Assyrian kingdom to become the first of the great empires of the Middle Eastern antiquity. Assyria had gone through a period of recession and corruption, plagued by civil war and a revolt of vassal states. When Tiglath-Pilaser III took the throne, he made some administrative changes that transformed the kingdom into an empire. The transformation of Assyria was so profound that he became known as the great founder of the Assyrian Empire. When Tiglath-Pilaser took the throne, he made some brilliant moves in the east and southern Mesopotamia, strengthening and securing his position. Then he moved west. He took tribute from the Phoenician cities on the Mediterranean coast, which renewed Assyrian control over that trade, which had already existed for years. He then took tribute of 1,000 talents of silver from Menahem, king of the northern kingdom of Israel. He then turned his attention to the north and put down a rebellion of Urartu, who had formed a coalition against him with several smaller syro hittite states whom he annexed into his empire. These syro hittite states were a collection of smaller Hittite states left over after the collapse of the Hittite Empire. These remnants of the Hittite Empire disappeared under Assyrian occupation. Tiglath-Pilaser III then returned to the Levant to put down a coalition of the Arameans of Damascus under King Rezin and the northern kingdom of Israel under King Pekah, a captain who had launched a coup against Pekinah, the son of Menahem. Nations of the Levant had formed a coalition against Assyria, hoping to be backed by their former overlord, Egypt. The kingdom of Judah alone, under King Ahaz, had allied with Assyria against the coalition. Tiglath-Pilaser III marched down the Levant coast, taking city by city until he subjugated the Philistine cities of Ascalon and Gaza. After dominating the coast, he then marched on Damascus, killing King Rezin. He marched down the east side of the Jordan, taking the land of Gilead into captivity, as well as Ammon and Moab. He moved the people, each into different lands, and set governors over them as provinces of Assyria. He then returned to Galilee, taking several cities of the northern kingdom of Israel, he took all of Galilee and all of Naphtali as captives and did not stop his campaign until King Pekah of Israel was killed in a palace coup and his replacement, Hoshea, paid tribute and homage to the Assyrian king. Tiglath-Pileser III then returned to southern Mesopotamia to put down a civil war which had broken out there after his vassal king over Babylon had been assassinated. After putting down the war in lower Mesopotamia, Tiglath-Pilaser III subjugated the entire area under Assyrian governors. In a New Year's Day ceremony at Babylon, he took the hand of Bel, the patron god of Babylon, thus making himself the king of Babylon also. Shalmanassar V, 727 to 722 BC, was the son of Tiglath-Pilaser III. Upon the death of his father, he became the king of Assyria and Babylon. When Israel heard of it, the northern kingdom under Hoshea revolted. This was common because they were under great oppression from paying tribute and they knew that when they could no longer pay they would be annexed and deported like their neighbors were. When a new king took the throne this was the best time to revolt. He may be weak unlike his father was. 
Each time a new king took the throne, his first act was usually to show his power by quelling several revolts. Shalmaneser marched upon the northern kingdom of Israel. Hoshea came out to meet him and pay tribute, but he was taken captive and the city of Samaria was besieged for two years. The city of Samaria was the capital city of the northern kingdom of Israel. Sargon II, 721 to 705 BC. During the siege of Samaria, the capital city of Israel, Shalmanazar V died and was replaced by Sargon II in 721. Sargon II claimed to be the son of Shalmanazar, but historians believe he was a usurper who took the name of Sargon, the great Akkadian king of ancient Mesopotamia. Sargon took the city of Samaria and took the people of the northern kingdom into captivity, replacing them with another people, who would become known as the Samaritans. This began the captivity of the lost ten tribes of Israel. The Assyrian Empire was now in full bloom. Assyria had full control over trade through the entire Middle East. This raised great concerns in both Elam and in Egypt the two largest kingdoms who had been weakened by these events. Egypt was cut off from the Phoenicians, as well as the vast cedars of Lebanon, while Elam had been cut off from Anatolia and from Phoenician trade, which they had come to depend on. While Sargon was in the west, a usurper named Merodach Baladin led a revolt in Babylon backed by Elam. He overthrew the governor of Babylon and seized the Babylonian throne. Sargon went to battle with Elam and Babylon, ending in a stalemate. Babylon continued to build up its defenses over the next decade, while Sargon turned his attention to a revolt in Anatolia among the Urartu. He put down this revolt within a year. At the same time, Egypt had been forming a conspiracy in the Levant, a loose coalition to find out who would be willing to join the revolt should Egypt possibly join the fight. King Hezekiah of Judah received envoys from the Ethiopian rulers of Egypt during this time. He sought counsel from the prophet Isaiah, who counseled him to refuse them. Hezekiah refused to join and continued to pay tribute to Sargon. The king of Ashdod, the principal city of the Philistines, did accept the offer of the Egyptians and led a revolt of several nations in the Levant, who all stopped paying Assyria. Sargon sent his general Tarton to Ashdod in 711 BC to quell the revolt. This is recorded in Isaiah chapter 20. The prophet Isaiah was told to take off his sandals and walk naked among the people for three years, prophesying that the Egyptians would eventually be led away captive by Assyria, naked as he was. The general Tartan did quell the revolt in Ashdod and set up a king who would be loyal to Assyria. Soon after Tartan left, they again revolted. This time Sargon himself came to Ashdod. The king of Ashdod fled into Egypt for protection, but Egypt avoided conflict with Sargon by handing over the king of Ashdod. Philistia was then made into an Assyrian province with an Assyrian governor. Sargon then went to Babylon and besieged Merodach Baladin in Babylon for two years, until Merodach Babylon escaped and fled to Elam. Sargon entered Babylon and took the hand of Bel, as Tiglath Pilaser III had done, but he proclaimed himself governor rather than king over Babylon. Three years later, Sargon attended a small battle in Anatolia where he was killed in battle. The son of Sargon II was Sennacherib, 705-681 BC. When Sennacherib took the throne, the Anatolians and the Elamites were busy with their own problems. 
Cimmerian invaders from the north were becoming an increasing problem. At this time, Merodach Baladin returned from his exile in Elam and took the throne of Babylon for himself again. At the same time, the Phoenician cities of Sidon, Ascalon, and Hezekiah, king of Judah, refused to pay tribute. Egypt was still fostering revolt in the region and promising alliances. Sennacherib moved first against Babylon, plundering its palaces and installing his own king there. Merodach Baladan had once again escaped, this time into the marshes of lower Mesopotamia where the sea people lived. Sennacherib then marched into the Levant. He conquered the entire Phoenician coast and into Philistia. He retook Ascalon and routed Egyptian forces at Raphia, a town on the coast just south of Gaza, turning the Egyptian forces back to Egypt in defeat. He, however, could not take the island city of Tyre. He even attacked Tyre with a fleet of 60 ships after occupying the island of Cyprus from the sea, but lost in a bloody battle against the city of Tyre. Sennacherib then turned his attention towards Judah. He first attacked the city of Lahish, the second largest city in Judah after Jerusalem. He eventually took Lahish and its surrounding towns after a long siege, 46 cities in total, he boasted. The large siege rampart built by Sennacherib can still be seen at Tel Lahish in Israel. Hezekiah then reconsidered his position and paid tribute to Sennacherib. 2 Kings chapter 18, starting verse 14. And Hezekiah, king of Judah, sent to the king of Assyria to Lahish, saying, I have offended. Return from me. That which thou puttest on me I will bear. And the king of Assyria appointed unto Hezekiah, king of Judah, three hundred talents of silver and thirty talents of gold. And Hezekiah gave him all the silver that was found in the house of the Lord and in the treasures of the king's house. At that time did Hezekiah cut off the gold from the doors of the temple of the Lord and from the pillars which Hezekiah, king of Judah, had overlaid and gave it to the king of Assyria. So Hezekiah plundered the temple to to pay the king of Assyria. Sennacherib then moved upon Jerusalem anyway. He sent three of his captains to demand Jerusalem's surrender. Up to that time, Hezekiah had been fortifying Jerusalem. He built up several walls and built his famous tunnel to supply water to the city internally. The Assyrians were renowned for their cruelty. They would skin people alive in front of the city. They would stack piles of heads just to make a point that they were the most feared power on earth. Here is a quote from Sennacherib regarding his conquest of Judah. Quote, I cut their throats like lambs. I cut off their precious lives like a string. Like the many waters of a storm, I made their gullets and entrails run down upon the wide earth. My prancing steeds harnessed for my riding plunged into the streams of blood as a river. The wheels of my war chariot, which brings low the wicked and the evil, were bespattered with blood and filth. With the bodies of their warriors I filled the plain like grass. Their testicles I cut off and tore out their privates like the seeds of cucumbers. End quote. Hezekiah refused to open the gates of Jerusalem, and the Assyrians taunted them from outside. They also taunted the God of Jerusalem, Yahweh. Hezekiah then went into the temple and prayed before Yahweh. God then gave Hezekiah and Sennacherib a long prophecy, which is written in Isaiah chapter 37. That night God sent an angel to the Assyrian camp, and slaughtered 185,000 men. Sennacherib then marched home to Nineveh with his army. His two sons killed him and escaped into Armenia, while his third son, Esarhaddon, took the throne. 
Now we have briefly gone over the history of Assyria for this time period. We can now take a closer look into the internal history of Israel and Judah during these same events. This will lead us to understanding the key of David. Now beginning with Ahaz, king of Judah, he faced a coalition between Israel and Damascus, who went into battle against him. So Israel and, Israel and Damascus were in a coalition against Tiglath-Pilaser III. And Judah, Ahaz, king of Judah, refused to join their coalition. So they went to battle against him, planning to install their own king over Judah, who would join the coalition. Now, reading Isaiah, starting in chapter 7, verse 1. And it came to pass in the days of Ahaz, the son of Jotham, the son of Uzziah, king of Judah, that Rezin, the king of Syria, and Pekah, the son of Remaliah, king of Israel, went up towards Jerusalem to war against it, but could not prevail against it. And it was told to the house of David, saying, Syria is confederate with Ephraim, and his heart was moved, and the heart of his people, as the trees of the wood, were moved with the wind. Then said the Lord unto Isaiah, Go forth now to meet Ahaz, thou and Shear Jeshub thy son, at the end of the conduit of the upper pool in the highway of the fuller's field, and say to him, Take heed and be quiet. Fear not, neither be faint-hearted for the two tails of these smoking firebrands. For the fierce anger of Rezin with Syria and the son of Ramalia, because Syria, Ephraim, and the son of Ramalia have taken evil counsel against thee, saying, Let us go up against Judah and vex it, and let us make a breach therein for us, and set a king in the midst of it, even the son of Tabeel. Thus says the Lord God, It shall not stand, neither shall it come to pass. For the head of Syria is Damascus, and the head of Damascus is Rezin. And within threescore and five years shall Ephraim be broken, that it not be a people. And the head of Ephraim is Samaria, and the head of Samaria is Ramalia's son. If you will not believe, surely you shall not be established. Moreover, the Lord spoke again to Ahaz, saying, Ask thee a sign of the Lord thy God. Ask it either in the depth or in the height above. But Ahaz said, I will not ask, neither will I tempt the Lord. And he said, Hear you now, O house of David. Is it a small thing for you to weary men? But will you weary my God also? Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. Butter and honey he shall eat, that he may know to refuse the evil and choose the good. For before the child shall know to refuse the evil and choose the good, the land that thou abhorrest shall be forsaken of both her kings. The Lord shall bring upon thee and upon thy people and upon thy father's house days that have not come from the day that Ephraim departed from Judah, even the king of Assyria. And it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall hiss for the fly that is in the uttermost parts of the rivers of Egypt, and for the bee that is in the land of Assyria. And they shall come and shall rest, all of them, in the desolate valleys, and in the holes of the rocks, and upon all the thorns, and upon all the bushes. And in the same day shall the Lord shave with a razor that is hired, namely, by them beyond the river, by the king of Assyria, the head and the hair of the feet, and it shall also consume the beard. And it shall come to pass in that day that a man shall nourish a young cow and two sheep. And it shall come to pass for the abundance of milk that they shall give, he shall eat butter. For butter and honey shall every one eat that is left in the land. And it shall come to pass in that day that every place shall be 
where there were a thousand vines at a thousand silverlings, it shall be even for briars and thorns. With arrows and with bows shall men come thither, because all the land shall become briars and thorns. And on all hills that shall be digged with the mattock, there shall not come thither the fear of briars and thorns, but it shall be for the sending forth of oxen and for the treading of lesser cattle. Now, there's a duality in prophecy, as I've spoken this before. In Judaism, they teach that Emmanuel is Hezekiah, the next king of Judah. While Christianity teaches that the Emmanuel is referring to Jesus Christ, they are both correct. There's a dual fulfillment in prophecy, the physical and the spiritual fulfillment. There's not enough time in this video to go through it all, but I just want to show you how this duality applies. In Matthew chapter 1, starting verse 19, we read, Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man, and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privily. But when he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Now all this was done, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel which being interpreted is God with us. So, in Hezekiah's time, Judah became a refuge in the desolated land. Judah was the only place not conquered by Assyria. And the Assyrian invasion ended the Arameans and the northern part of Israel. Um, in the King James Bible, it was say Syrian, but the Syrian land did not really exist. It was that was named later by the Greeks. At this time, it was Aram. Aram uh, was the people, and their capital city was Damascus, and they were called the Arameans. So Ahaz did not listen to Isaiah. Instead, he made an alliance with Assyria, and he sent him silver and gold from the house of Yahweh and from the king's treasure. So he, he, this is with Tiglath-Pileser III. And Isaiah was not happy with this coalition, and he counseled Ahaz to trust in Yahweh alone, but Ahaz didn't listen to him. We read in Second Chronicles chapter 28, starting in verse 20, And Tiglath-Pileser, king of Assyria, came unto him and distressed him, but strengthened him not. For Ahaz took away a portion out of the house of the Lord, and out of the house of the king, and of the princes, and he gave it to the king of Assyria. But he helped him not. And in the time of his distress did he trespass yet more against the Lord. This is that king Ahaz, for he sacrificed unto the gods of Damascus, which smote him. And he said, Because of the gods of Syria help them, therefore I will sacrifice to them, that they may help me. But they were the ruin of him and of all Israel. And Ahaz gathered together the vessels of the house of God, and cut in pieces the vessels of the house of God, and shut up the doors of the house of the Lord. And he made altars in every corner of Jerusalem, and in every city of Judah he made high places to burn incense to other gods. And he provoked to anger the Lord God of his fathers. After Israel and Aram were destroyed, Tiglath-Pileser III expected Judah to be a vassal state and pay tribute. 
Ahaz traveled to Damascus to swear allegiance to Tiglath-Pileser and to his gods. When he was there, he saw an altar he liked, and he had a copy of it made for the temple in Jerusalem. He brought the Assyrian religion into Jerusalem, and also the Canaanite deities. He made changes to the priesthood and the sacrifices, thus mixing the temple worship of Yahweh with Assyrian and Canaanite religions. And he closed up the temple and he put this altar that he copied from Damascus in front of the temple doors on the porch and they used that there on the porch and the temple was shut up. Now we'll read about Hezekiah, the son of Ahaz. I'll just read it from the scriptures because it's quicker. It it just says it all. So starting in 2 Chronicles, chapter 29, starting in verse 1. Hezekiah began to reign when he was five and twenty years old, and he reigned nine and twenty years in Jerusalem. And his mother's name was Abijah, the daughter of Zechariah. And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, according to all that David his father had done. And he, in the first year of his reign, in the first month, opened the doors of the house of the Lord and repaired them. And he brought in the priests and the Levites and gathered them together into the east street. And he said to them, Hear me, you Levites, sanctify now yourselves and sanctify the house of the Lord God of your fathers, and carry forth the filthiness out of the holy place. For our fathers have trespassed, and done that which was evil in the eyes of the Lord our God, and have forsaken him, and have turned away their faces from the habitation of the Lord, and turned their backs. And they have shut up the doors of the porch, and have put out the lamps, and have not burned incense, nor offered burnt offerings in the holy place unto the God of Israel. Wherefore the wrath of the Lord was upon Judah and Jerusalem, and he has delivered them to trouble, to astonishment, and to hissing, as you see with your eyes. For lo, our fathers have fallen by the sword, and our sons and daughters and our wives are in captivity for this. Now it is in my heart to make a covenant with the Lord God of Israel that his fierce wrath may turn away from us. My sons, be not now negligent, for the Lord has chosen you to stand before him to serve him, that you should minister unto him and burn incense. End quote. So Hezekiah turns what is left of the house of Israel, that is, the northern kingdom has already been taken captive, and it's just Judah. So he turns Judah back to the true God, and Judah becomes an island in the sea of Assyria. Hezekiah is a symbolic forerunner of Jesus Christ. Judaism had mixed Assyrian and Babylonian customs with the customs of Moses while they were exiled in Babylon, And Jesus Christ came to purify the Jews to the true worship, just as Hezekiah had purged the temple of paganism. And now, to carry on the prophecy concerning Emmanuel, we'll take a quick look at Isaiah chapter 8. This carries on from chapter 7 that we already read about the virgin giving birth and calling his name Emmanuel. In this part, which is describing the invasion of Assyria during Hezekiah's time, we also see the stone of stumbling being laid in Zion. This is where the messianic prophecy related to Christianity becomes more and more obvious. So Isaiah chapter 8, verse 1. Moreover, the Lord said to me, Take thee a great roll and write in it with a man's pen concerning Maher Shalal Hashbaz. And I took unto me faithful witnesses to record, Uriah the priest and Zechariah the son of Zeberchiah. And I went unto the prophetess, and she conceived and bore a son. Then said the Lord to me, Call his name Maher Shalal Hashbaz. 
For before the child shall have knowledge to cry, My father and my mother, the riches of Damascus and the spoil of Samaria shall be taken away before the king of Assyria. So this is speaking of the conditions before Hezekiah and also before Jesus Christ. We're we're back in Isaiah talking to Ahaz, Hezekiah's father. Yeah, this is before Tiglath-Pileser III took away the northern kingdom. This was Isaiah prophesying during the days of Ahaz, the father of Hezekiah. Now, carry on in verse 5. The Lord spoke also unto me again, saying, For as much as this people refuses the waters of Shiloh that go softly, and rejoice in resin, and Ramalia's son. Now therefore, behold, the Lord brings up upon them the waters of the river, strong and many, even the king of Assyria, and all his glory, and he shall come up over all his channels, and go over all his banks, and he shall pass through Judah. He shall overflow and go over, he shall reach even to the neck, and the stretching out of his wings shall fill the breadth of thy land, O Emmanuel. Now, if Emmanuel represents Hezekiah and Jesus Christ, then who does Assyria represent in the time of Jesus Christ? It's the secular empire of Rome. Rome also came in and filled the breadth of the land of Judea. So let's continue with Isaiah, chapter 8, starting in verse 9. Associate yourselves, O you people, and you shall be broken in pieces. And give ear, all you far countries. Gird yourselves, and you shall be broken in pieces. Gird yourselves, and you shall be broken in pieces. Take counsel together, and it shall come to naught. Speak the word, and it shall not stand. For God is with us. For the Lord spoke thus to me with a strong hand, and instructed me that I should not walk in the way of this people, saying, Say you not a confederacy. To all them to whom this people shall say a confederacy, neither fear you their fear, nor be afraid. Sanctify the Lord of hosts himself, and let him be your fear, and let him be your dread. So now here comes the stone of stumbling next. We will do a video on the stone of stumbling later on. But this is a highly Christian prophecy about the gospel in Judea and in the world of the Romans. Now remember the Romans also spiritually, the Assyrians carried away Ephraim, the nation of the northern kingdom. And as we have studied, Ephraim came to represent the Christians who believed the gospel. Uh, So Rome spiritually carried away the Christians. Okay, so let's carry on. Um, Isaiah chapter 8. And he shall be for a sanctuary but for a stone of stumbling and for a rock of offense to both the houses of Israel, and for a gin and for a snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And many among them shall stumble and fall and be broken and be snared and taken. Bind up the testimony, seal the law among my disciples, and I will wait upon the Lord that hides his face from the house of Jacob, and I will look for him, Behold, I and the children whom the Lord has given me are for signs and for wonders in Israel from the Lord of hosts, which dwells in Mount Zion. And when they shall say unto you, Seek unto them that have familiar spirits and unto wizards that peep and that mutter, should not a people seek unto their God for the living to the dead? To the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. And they shall pass through it, hardly to be stead and hungry. And it shall come to pass, that when they shall be hungry, 
they shall fret themselves and curse their king and their God and look upward. And they shall look unto the earth and behold trouble and darkness, dimness of anguish, and they shall be driven to darkness. So the ones driven to darkness are the ones in the world who have rejected the law or the testimony because they have to have both. So you must have both to survive. The Christian world largely rejects the law, while the Jewish world largely rejects the testimony of the gospel. But those who have both are like a rock in a flood. It's just like Jesus explained in Matthew chapter 7. Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man which built his house upon a rock. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. And every one that hears these sayings of mine and does, does them not shall be likened unto a foolish man which built his house upon the sand. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. So I'm just showing the duality here between the time of Hezekiah and Judah being like an island within the midst of Assyria and also of Jesus, the gospel of Jesus, becoming an island in the midst of Rome and in the midst of Judaism and Christianity. So now we're going to take a closer look at Hezekiah when Sennacherib attacked. 2 Kings chapter 18, starting in verse 13. Now in the fourteenth year of King Hezekiah did Sennacherib, king of Assyria, come up against all the fenced cities of Judah and took them. And Hezekiah, king of Judah, sent to the king of Assyria to Lahish, saying, I have offended, return from me, and that which thou puttest on me I will bear. And the king of Assyria appointed unto Hezekiah, king of Judah, three hundred talents of silver and thirty talents of gold. And Hezekiah gave him all the silver that was found in the house of the Lord and in the treasures of the king's house. At that time Hezekiah cut off the gold from the doors of the temple of the Lord and from the pillars which Hezekiah king of Judah had overlaid and gave it to the king of Assyria. So this was the time when Sennacherib had taken Lahish and was heading for Jerusalem. He had taken 46 cities in Judah. Hezekiah decided to pay him tribute to try to stop him, but he was going to be besieged anyway. So now Isaiah chapter 36 and 37 describes this event. Um, starting in Isaiah chapter 36 verse 1. Now it came to pass in the fourteenth year of King Hezekiah that Sennacherib king of Assyria came up against all the defense cities of Judah and took them. And the king of Assyria sent Rabshakeh from Lahish to Jerusalem unto King Hezekiah with a great army. And he stood by the conduit of the upper pool in the highway of the fuller's field. Then came forth unto him Eliakim, Hilkiah's son, which was over the house, and Shebna the scribe, and Joah Asaph's son the recorder. And Rabshakeh said to them, Say you now to Hezekiah. So here's the message now that the king of Assyria, Sennacherib, is sending to Hezekiah. Thus says the great king, the king of Assyria, What confidence is this wherein thou trusts? I say, sayest you, but they are vain words. I have counsel and strength for war. Now on whom do you trust that you rebel against me? Lo, you trust in the staff of this broken reed on Egypt, whereon if a man leans, it will go into his hand and pierce it. So is the Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to all that trust him. 
But if you say to me, We trust in the Lord our God, is it not he whose high places and whose altars Hezekiah has taken away, and said to Judah and to Jerusalem, You shall worship before this altar? So he's saying, first of all, on who do you trust? You trust Pharaoh because he is weak. Do you trust Yahweh, your God? Isn't this the God that Hezekiah took away all his all of his altars? So um, Hezekiah took away all the pagan altar, altars and all the altars of the Assyrian gods that his father had brought in. But the king of Assyria is saying that those are the gods of Jehovah. And Hezekiah has taken them away. So he has offended God. So carrying on in Isaiah chapter 36. Now therefore give pledges, I pray thee, to my master, the king of Assyria. And I will give thee two thousand horses, if you are able on your part to set riders upon them. How then will you turn away the face of one captain of the least of my master's servants and put your trust in Egypt for chariots and for horsemen? And am I now come up without the Lord against this land to destroy it? The Lord said to me, go up against this land and destroy it. So first of all, he's saying, uh, you don't have any horses. And even if I gave you 2,000 horses, you wouldn't even be able to put riders on them. And then he's also saying, you're trusting in Yahweh to protect you, but Yahweh sent me here to destroy you. So he's, he's trying to convince them to surrender, this uh, captain from the king of Assyria. Now carrying on in Isaiah chapter 36 uh, from verse 11, and then said Eliakim and Shebna and Joah unto, so these are the three Jews on the wall. Now Eliakim is very important in our study. Um, he's attached to the key of David. Um, Eliakim was the chief of the house and Shebna was the scribe and Joah was um, one of the priests uh, a son of Asaph, which would be uh, one of the singers from the temple. So then said Eliakim and Shebna and Joah unto Rabshakeh, Speak, I pray thee, unto thy servants in the Syrian language, that, that is in Aramaic. For we understand it, and speak not to us in the Jews' language, that is Hebrew, in the ears of the people that are on the wall. But Rab Shaka said, Has my master sent me to thy master and to thee to speak these words? Has he not sent me to the men that sit upon the wall, that they may eat their own dung and drink their own piss with you? Then Rab Shaka stood and cried with a loud voice in the Jews' language and said, Hear you the words of the great king, the king of Assyria. Thus says the king, let not Hezekiah deceive you, for he shall not be able to deliver you. L neither let Hezekiah make you trust in Yahweh, saying that Yahweh will surely deliver us. This city shall not be delivered into the hand of the king of Assyria. Hearken not to Hezekiah, for thus says the king of Assyria, Make an agreement with me by a present, and come out to me and eat every one of his vine, and every one of his fig tree, and drink every one the waters of his own cistern, until I come and take you away to a land, a land like your own land, a land of corn and wine, a land of bread and vineyards. Beware lest Hezekiah persuade you, saying that Yahweh will deliver us. Has any of the gods of the nation delivered his land out of the hand of the king of Assyria? Where are the gods of Hamath and Arphad? Where are the gods of Sepharvim? Have they delivered Samaria out of my hand? Who are they among all the gods of these lands that had delivered their land out of my hand? 
that Yahweh should deliver Jerusalem out of my hand. But they held their peace and answered him not a word, for the king's commandment was, answer him not. So here he challenges even Yahweh, saying no God can stand against Assyria. Even the northern kingdom of Israel could not stand against Assyria. And he's promising them, I will transfer you to a good land of corn and wine and bread and if you surrender to me. So he's going to take them out of the land just like he did to the northern kingdom. This was a common practice of the Assyrians. They displaced every nation into different lands uh, because they had more control over them that way. So carrying on with Isaiah 36, Then came Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah, that was over the household, and Shebna the scribe, and Joah the son of Asaph the recorder, to Hezekiah with their clothes rent, and told him the words of Rabshakeh. Now beginning Isaiah chapter 37, And it came to pass, when King Hezekiah heard it, that he rent his clothes, and covered himself with sackcloth, and went into the house of the Lord. And he sent Eliakim, who was over the household, and Shabna the scribe, and the elders of the priests covered with sackcloth to Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amos. And they said to him, Thus says Hezekiah, This day is a day of trouble and of rebuke and of blasphemy. For the children are come to the birth, and there is not strength to bring forth. It may be the Lord thy God will hear the words of Rabshakeh, whom the king of Assyria his master has sent to reproach the living God, and will reprove the words which the Lord thy God has heard. Wherefore, lift up your prayer for the remnant that is left. Now Hezekiah, he listened to the counsel of Eliakim, and commanded them to seek out Isaiah, and the king went into the temple to pray to Yahweh. I will show very shortly how I know it was Eliakim's idea. Carrying on in Isaiah chapter 37, starting in verse 5. So the servants of King Hezekiah came to Isaiah, and Isaiah said to them, Thus shall you say to your master, Thus says the Lord, Be not afraid of the words that thou hast heard, wherewith the servants of the king of Assyria had blasphemed me. Behold, I will send a blast upon him, and he shall hear a rumor and return to his own land, and I will cause him to fall by the sword in his own land. So Yahweh is offended, and he does give his blessing to Judah. Carrying on Isaiah chapter 37, starting in verse 8. So Rabshakeh returned and found the king of Assyria warring against Libna, for he had heard that he was departed from Lahish, and he heard say concerning Terhaka, king of Ethiopia, which they called in history, he was a pharaoh of Egypt at that time. He was from, he was an Ethiopian pharaoh. So he heard say concerning this Ethiopian pharaoh, he is come forth to make war with thee. And when he heard it, he sent messengers to Hezekiah, saying, Thus shall you speak to Hezekiah king of Judah, saying, Let not thy God in whom thou trust deceive you, saying, Jerusalem shall not be given into the hand of the king of Assyria. Behold, thou hast heard what the kings of Assyria had done to all the lands by destroying them utterly, and shall thou be delivered? Have the gods of the nations delivered them which my fathers have destroyed, as Gozan and Haran and Rezeph and the children of Eden, which were in Telassar? Where is the king of Hamath and the king of Arphad and the king of the city of Ser- Sepharvam, Hena and Iva? And Hezekiah received the letter from the hand of messengers and read it. And Hezekiah went up to the house of the Lord and spread it before the Lord. And Hezekiah prayed to the Lord, saying, O Lord of hosts, God of Israel, that dwells between the cherubims, thou art the God, even thou alone, of all kingdoms of the earth, thou hast made heaven and earth. 
Incline your ear, O Lord, and hear. Open your eyes, O Lord, and see, and hear all the words of Sennacherib, which has sent to reproach the living God. Of a truth, Lord, the kings of Assyria have laid waste to all nations and their countries, and have cast their gods into the fire, for they were not gods, but the work of men's hands, wood and stone. Therefore they have destroyed them. Now therefore, O Lord our God, save us from his hand, that all the kingdoms of earth may know that thou art the Lord, even thou only. Then Isaiah the son of Amoz sent to Hezekiah, saying, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, Whereas thou hast prayed to me against Sennacherib king of Assyria, this is the word which the Lord has spoken concerning him. The virgin, the daughter of Zion, has despised thee, and laughed thee to scorn. The daughter of Jerusalem has shaken her head at thee. Whom hast thou reproached and blasphemed? And against whom hast thou exalted your voice, and lifted up your eyes on high, even against the Holy One of Israel? By your servants you have reproached the Lord, and has said, By the multitude of my chariots I have come to the height of the mountains, to the sides of Lebanon, and I will cut down the tall cedars thereof, and the choice fir trees thereof, and I will enter into the height of his border, and the forest of his Carmel. I have digged and drunk water, and with the sole of my feet I have dried up all the rivers of the besieged places, has thou not heard long ago how I have done it, and of ancient times that I have formed it? Now have I brought it to pass that thou should be to lay waste defense cities into ruinous heaps. Therefore their inhabitants were of small power, they were dismayed and confounded, they were as the grass of the field, and as the green herb, as the grass on the housetops and as the corn blasted before it is grown up. But I know thy abode, and thy going out, and thy coming in, and thy rage against me. Because thy rage against me, and thy turmoil is come up into my ears, therefore I will put my hook in your nose, and my bridle in your lips, and I will turn you back by the way which you came, and this shall be a sign to, to you. You shall eat this year such as grows of itself, and the second year that which springs of the same, and in the third year sow and reap and plant vineyards and eat the fruit. And the remnant that is escaped of the house of Judah shall again take root downward and bear fruit upward, for out of Jerusalem shall go forth a remnant, and they that escaped out of Mount Zion, the zeal of the Lord of hosts shall do this. Therefore thus says the Lord concerning the king of Assyria, He shall not come into this city, nor shoot an arrow there, nor come before it with shields, nor cast a bank against it. By the way that he came, by the same he shall return, and he shall not come to this city, says the Lord. For I will defend this city to save it for my own sake and for my servant David's sake. Then the angel of the Lord went forth and smote in the camp of the Assyrians a hundred and fourscore and five thousand. And when they arose early in the morning, behold, they were all dead corpses. So Sennacherib, king of Assyria, departed and went and returned and dwelt at Nineveh. And it came to pass, as he was worshipping in the house of Nisroch, his god, that Adramelech and Sherezer, his sons, smote him with the sword, and they escaped into the land of Armenia, and Esarhaddon, his son, reigned in his stead. Okay, so this event was Sennacherib offending God and Hezekiah using that information, uh, pleading with God that he has blasphemed and for God's own honor to defend the city, that God himself defeated Sennacherib, the king of Assyria. So this here is directly related to the key of David. So now we're going to put it all together. The next prophecy we're going to look 
at was given years earlier during the reign of Sargon II when he came to Philistia and he sent his general Tartan and he returned to Assyria and he bypassed Judah Judah rejoiced in the streets when he bypassed Judah and this was during the time that Isaiah was walking naked for three years prophesying against the Egyptians so Judah rejoiced when when Sargon left and went back to Babylon without touching Judah so during that time this is when Isaiah prophesied the burden of the valley of vision what aileth thee now that thou art wholly gone up to the housetops thou that art full of stirs a tumultuous city a joyous city that slain men are not slain with the sword nor dead in battle all all thy rulers are fled together they are bound by the archers all that are found in thee are bound together which have fled from far therefore said i look away from me i will weep bitterly labor not to comfort me because of the spoiling of the daughter of my people so they're rejoicing in jerusalem but god is not rejoicing he's weeping bitterly for it is a day of trouble and of treading down and of perplexity by the Lord God of hosts in the valley of vision, breaking down the walls and crying to the mountains. And Elam bore the quiver with chariots of men and horsemen, and Kerr uncovered the shield. And it, co it shall come to pass that thy choicest valleys shall be full of chariots, and the horsemen shall set themselves in array at the gate. And he discovered the covering of Judah, and thou did look in that day to the armor of the house of the forest. You have seen also the breaches of the city of David, that they are many. And you gathered together the waters of the lower pool. You have numbered the houses of Jerusalem, and the houses have you broken down to fortify the wall. You also made a ditch between the two walls for the water of the old pool but you have not looked unto the maker thereof, neither had respect to him that fashioned it long ago. And in that day, the Lord God of hosts called to weeping and mourning and to baldness and to girding with sackcloth. And behold, joy and gladness, slaying oxen and killing sheep, eating flesh and drinking wine, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we shall die. And it was revealed in my ears by the Lord of hosts, Surely this iniquity shall not be purged from you till you die, said the Lord God of hosts. So now he's going to start talking about Shebna the scribe, and he was one of the three that was on the wall when Sennacherib came, and he, he will also talk about Eliakim, who was put over the household. Now during the time when Sennacherib came and the Eliakim and Shebna spoke to him from the wall, Eliakim was already over the household. Um, so Isaiah is prophesying this ahead of time during the days of Ahaz, Hezekiah's father. So beginning in Isaiah chapter 22, this is the key prophecy that we're going to look at. Thus says the Lord God of hosts, Go, get thee unto this treasurer, even unto Shebna, which is over the house, and say, What hast thou here? And, an, and whom hast thou here, that thou hast hewed thee out a sepulchre here, a grave, as he that hews him out a sepulchre on high, and that graves a habitation for himself in a rock. Behold, the Lord will carry thee away with a mighty captivity, and will surely cover thee. 
He will surely violently turn and toss thee like a ball into a large country, and there thou shalt die. And there the chariots of thy glory shall be the shame of the Lord's house. And I will drive thee from thy station, and from thy state shall he pull thee down. And it shall come to pass in that day that I will call my servant Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah, and I will clothe him with thy robe, and strengthen him with thy girdle, and I will commit thy government into his hand. And he shall be a father to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and to the house of Judah. And the key of the house of David I will lay upon his shoulder, so he shall open and none shall shut, and he shall shut and none shall open. And I will fasten him as a nail in a sure place, and he shall be for a glorious throne to his father's house. And they shall hang upon him all the glory of his father's house, and the offspring and the issue, all vessels of small quantity, from the vessels of cups, even to all the vessels of flagons. And in that day, says the Lord of hosts, shall the nail that is fastened in a sure place be removed, and be cut down and fall, and the burden that was upon it shall be cut off, for the Lord has spoken it. So Eliakim was given the key of D- the key of David, which has two functions. He will be a father to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and to the house of Judah, and he will open and none will shut, and he will shut and none will open. So what does this opening and shutting have to do with? Well, under Ahaz, the king of Judah, the temple doors were shut. And he set up idols to other gods in front of the temple. And then under his son, Hezekiah, the temple doors were open. So it could have something to do with that. But if you read carefully the prophecy about Eliakim, who has the key of David, and he is fastened like a nail, and they hung all the... All the um, sacrificial vessels on this nail and then he pulled the nail out so all the vessels fell well this is referring to jesus christ and and ending the temple sacrifice in jerusalem because after jesus was crucified died and resurrected um, the temple was destroyed and it ended the temple sacrifice. That was directly related to Jesus because Jesus ended the temple purification for sins. Jesus died for our sins. There's no, no, no longer a need for a temple. So this is the nail being pulled out and the cups all falling on the ground. And so that could be, have to do with the shutting and the opening where Jesus shuts and opens the forgiveness from the temple. And there's also the gates of Jerusalem that can be shut and open. Um, now, if you follow along the history from the time of Sennacherib, eventually uh, Jerusalem was destroyed in 586 BC by the king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar II. And the Jews were taken captive to Babylon for 70 years until the Persian king, Cyrus the Great, who conquered Babylon, he allowed the Jewish people to return to their homeland and rebuild the temple. Isaiah also prophesied about Cyrus. If you listen to this prophecy of Isaiah, prophesying about Cyrus the Great, Listen here about opening and shutting. Isaiah chapter 45, starting in verse 1. Thus says the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have hold, to subdue nations before him, and I will loose the loins of kings to open before him the two-leaved gates, and the gates shall not be shut. And I will go before thee and make the crooked places straight. I will break in pieces the gates of brass and cut in sunder the bars of iron. 
and I will give thee the treasures of darkness and hidden riches of secret places, that thou may know that I, the Lord, which call thee by thy name, am the God of Israel. For Jacob my servant's sake, and Israel my elect, I have even called thee by thy name. I have surnamed thee, though thou hast not known me. I am the Lord, and there is none else. There is no God beside me. I girded thee, though thou hast not known me. That they may know from the rising of the sun and from the west that there is none beside me. I am the Lord, and there is no one else. I form the light and create darkness. I make peace and create evil. I, the Lord, do all these things. Drop down, you heavens, from above, and let the skies pour down righteousness. Let the earth open, and let them bring forth salvation, and let righteousness spring up together. I, the Lord, have created it. So now there's more shutting and opening, and it's about the gates of the city. And the gates are absolutely destroyed, that, so it's like they will never be shut again. Um, now, Revelation chapter 3, starting verse 7. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These things says he that is holy, and he that is true, he that has the key of David, he that opens, and no man shuts, and shuts, and no man opens. I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it. For thou hast a little strength, and hast kept my word, and hast not denied my name. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them come and worship before thy feet, and to know that I have loved thee, because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I will also keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world, to try them that dwell upon the earth. Behold, I come quickly. Hold fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. Him that overcomes I will make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall no more go out, and I will write upon him the name of my God, and the name of the city of my God, which is the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God, and I will write upon him my new name. He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. During the time of Samuel the prophet, the people of Israel demanded a king, just like the other nations. And Samuel was upset that they demanded a king. And God said to them, um, it, is not, it is not you they have rejected, it is me they have rejected. Because Yahweh was their king. And then they demanded a real king like the rest of the nations. And now through Jesus Christ, Yahweh has reclaimed his crown through David and Jesus Christ because they, on, he gave the promise to David that his son will sit on the, crown, on the throne forever as king of Israel. And Jesus Christ became that king. And in the book of Re Revelation, Jesus Christ and in the book of Isaiah Jesus Christ is being revealed as God himself. He, he says there is no other savior. I am he. He says that repeatedly. So this is the revelation. Now, when you think about God ruling over all the nations, even ruling over the Assyrians and Babylonians and Romans and every other nation, Nobody owns him. The Jews don't own God. The Christians don't own God. He owns them. That's what this is all about. He owns them. He chastises them. He does what he wants with them. They always try to put him in a box and say, oh, follow these rules and there you go. But God won't fit in a box. He... Um, he lays out his principles when he wants to and to who he wants to. 
So um, there's the law and the testimony. He says if they don't have the law and the testimony, there is no light in them. Thanks again for watching, and I'll see you soon. And what is the synagogue of Satan that's speak, spoken about here in Revelation chapter 3? That's what our next video is going to address, the synagogue of Satan. We'll see you then.